All right, so I'm going to talk in general. My topic was about PCI, but I think we are going to talk about top five things you guys got to know what is happening in the cath lab. Uh, apart from everything we have learned, um, I'll talk about some stent technology as well as some of the advanced interventions we are doing in uh, 10 odd minutes I may have. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So, <coughs> So first of all, invasive CAD assessment. Ooh, that came out a little odd. What is the first limitation of coronary angiogram? It underestimates coronary disease. You have to have 40% plaque burden for it to cause luminal narrowing often. So just because something looks normal in angiogram, it's not a normal coronary. It can over and underestimate. That's where we get IVUS. To look at intracoronaries, you can see that RCA, which looks reasonably healthy, actually is filled of tremendous amount of plaque, also a little bit of calcium. OCT adds even more information. OCT is very helpful when you are looking at stent struts, and this is a artery with a lot of neointimal hyperplasia, very stenosis in other words. FFR, everybody ought to know and understand because we have lesions which are intermediate, and you make clinical decisions on those 50 to 70 percent lesions. So the FFR value has to be less than, for it to be significant? 0.8, right? Remember that number. IFR is a new kid in the block, which is 0.89. We, some cath labs have it. I don't know if your all's cath lab will have it. But again, there's the RCA lesion. You can see the FFR is 0.85, so don't touch that. The best way to make a stable plaque unstable is to put in a stent. So don't do unnecessary stents. FFR here of that LED, which looks maybe 50%, maybe 60%, maybe 70%, guess what? It's 0 0.68. Data from FAME 1, FAME 2 tells us to fix those lesions. There are certain newer stents. A lot of, lot of things have advanced. Number one, failure has gotten very rare, almost less than 2%, less than 1%. Emergency bypass surgery is even less, 0.3%. Restenosis rates have gone from 30% now down to less than 10%. Stent thrombosis has gone down to 1% or 0.5%. And so is very late stent thrombosis, which is very low. If you design a new stent today, if your restenosis rates are more than 12%, don't even try to market it. If you design a new stent today, if your stent thrombosis rate is more than 0.6%, don't market it. Okay, those are the numbers you got to remember to make it an effective stent technology. We have moved from first to second generation stents. About 10 odd years ago, we were using Cypher 2003, Texas 2005. This were introduced, and that kind of revolutionized our field of interventional cardiology of drug eluting stent. But the ones in the green are the ones which we are called, what we call the second generation stents. I created this slide to let you guys appreciate some of the subtle changes we have made over the last 15, 20 years. As you can see, we have gone to newer alloys, so from stainless steel, we have moved on to platinum chromium or cobalt chromium. The strut thickness has remarkably reduced from 140, 150, now we are all the way down to 80s. Polymer thickness, which is used to coat the stent to deliver the drug all said and done, has also been reduced significantly. The drug of choice has moved away from paclitaxel to more of a nevrolimus. Not that these are bad drugs, but these are probably what is standard of care right now. And the elution time frame, we were always debated for years as to what is the perfect time. I think we have learned that more than three to six months is kind of unnecessary at this point. We have a new type of stent which is approved and a lot of the cath labs would have that and the idea behind this synergy stent is to only give the drug on the arterial wall side which is kind of very thoughtful because if you think about it the restenosis comes from the arterial wall side not the luminal side so why in the world do you want to put drug molecules there and if you don't want to put drug molecules on the luminal side we really don't need a polymer because polymer may possibly crack may actually cause chronic inflammation. So you put a polymer on the abluminal side, and then you only elude drug for three to four months, and that potentially may have benefit of that technology. Absorb is another approved stent in US today, which is that completely bioabsorbable scaffold. 
Um, it is very thick, it is 150 microns. It's kind of one of the downside of this new technology. Um, there's a lot more research going on in this particular field. So there in the next decade, as you guys go into practice, there may be some more options available. But as of right now, we have found that this bioabsorbable scaffold, which kind of dissolves at about two years, it sounds theoretically such a great idea, in the initial studies have really not panned out. One of the biggest challenge is stent thrombosis. Stent thrombosis rate is about 1.5%. So remember what did I say about stent thrombosis? 0.6% or less. So that is unacceptable, and because of that, it has not become the standard of care. Quick two lines on DAP therapy. Stents in ACS, ACS settings need for 12 months. So irrespective, irrespective of the type of stent you guys use, DAP has to be given for 12 months if it is done in the setting of ACS. Non-STEMI, STEMI, or even unstable angina patients who are in the hospital. So don't worry about what type of stent. It's always 12 months right now. DS in non-ACS sending, somebody who has a abnormal stress test, gets a cath, and you put in a stent, is now been reduced to six months, no longer one year, six months. And obviously, then the second topic I'm going to talk about, third, is left main stent. Syntex was a very landmark, very important trial for us, where it actually compared multivessel coronary artery disease, including left main patients, um, versus coronary artery bypass surgery versus multivessel PCI. And it actually found that PCI was inferior to bypass surgery in the primary endpoint of death MI or stroke, including unplanned revascularization. But then we started digging deeper through it, and then the idea of Syntex score came along. Syntex score was a score of the complexity of the anatomy of the coronary artery disease. The higher the score, the more the complex the anatomy, the harder the PCI work gets. So when we started looking into that, the lower the score, we found the difference between cabbage and PCI was less and less. Not only that, we realized that the stent we were using in Texas in the uh, Syntex trial was Texas, which is one of the earlier generations, something we kind of don't use a whole lot. And with the second generation DES called Zions, it is a little bit better uh, compared to Texas. So based upon that, a new trial was designed. It is called Excel. Everybody here should know Excel. Excel trial basically took about 2,000 patients, 1,000 patients went for PCI of left main, and other half went for bypass surgery. Again, those are patients who had lower syntax scores, so not the worst of the anatomy, but kind of low to intermediate, intermediate anatomy. And the primary endpoint, which was death, stroke, and MI at three years, um, had statistically no significant uh, difference at three years. In Excel summary, treatment of patients with left main coronary artery disease and low to intermediate syntax scores with the Zion stents have similar rates of primary endpoint. Plus, there are also fewer adverse events within the first 30 days compared to bypass surgery, you know, such as infections and arrhythmias and so on and so forth. So PCI for left main is becoming more popular. It can be acceptable. It can be considered on certain patients, but always discuss after discussion with your surgeons. Coronary CTO PCI, there are a lot of advances in this. Um, this field is um, becoming more robust from 40 to 50 percent success rates. We are almost up to the 80 percent success rates. And there are certain better wires, better crossing catheters, um, because there is an unmet need. I mean, even patients who go through bypass surgery, which is one of the commonest regions we send those patients, actually almost one third don't get that particular CTO artery bypass, which is very disappointing when you hear that for varieties of reason, but nonetheless, it would be pretty good if we can revascularize those CTOs in a cath lab. So to improve our uh, chances of getting successful stenting done, we have developed some new techniques. This is called reentry technique, where we go into the subintimal space, and with a special balloon and a wire, we kind of go back into the lumen <coughs> and put in a stent there. Um, I'm going to, well, let's see if I actually have time, or let's skip through this, and I'll show you another technique, which is a retrograde technique where we actually use the septal collateral. So time and again, you'll come, you'll come across, we went through the RCA to open up a LED CTO, vice versa. Um, it has been very effective and safe. You can even use epicardial collaterals, but those are usually more risky. And the last uh, thing I would like to talk about is the CHIP, where hemodynamic support uh, of Impella, Dr. Jenny to told us about that, are, is used more and more safely when the patient has a last conduit or a high-risk anatomy. Because whenever you do PCI, you run the risk of causing global ischemia in those patients, which in turn causes reduction of cardiac output, and a hemodynamic support devices are very helpful, especially in cardiogenic shock. 
So with that, I'm going to end my presentation. And if you guys have any questions, please fire on. Okay? Thank you. I got you guys done just on time.